Why do some people miss war? Why do some soldiers end up winning the battle but losing their minds? PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder has sadly become more and more prominent in our societies over the last few decades. But have soldiers always come home with shattered minds? Were the comrades of Achilles or Caesar suffering after putting down their swords? What is the history of this disorder? And what can it tell us about modern warfare and civilian life? Let's find out. The inspiration for this video came from Sebastian Junger's book, Tribe, which you can read or listen to over at Scribd, who have kindly offered to sponsor today's video. Scribd is a site that offers a huge library of books, audiobooks, magazines and other reading materials. With dozens of categories, it can cater to any interest and you'll always find something interesting to read. The most interesting thing that I found about Scribd was that they not only offer books and audiobooks, but also documents that I found extremely useful when researching for this video, along with live streams with celebrated authors, all for $8.99 per month, which is much cheaper than buying books and competing services. I highly recommend that you go check out Tribe over on Scribd by following the link in the description for a 30 day free trial. And I would really like to thank Scribd for sponsoring this video. What exactly is PTSD? Well, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, it can be caused by exposure to actual or threatened death and serious injury, along with recurrent, involuntary, intrusive, distressing memories of traumatic events, flashbacks, psychological distress and exposure to internal or external cues, angry outbursts, hypervigilance and experiences of feeling detached. Note that PTSD is not exclusive to combat. Combat is not even the leading cause of PTSD. PTSD can be triggered by car crashes, assaults and other traumatic experiences. But for this video, we will be focusing on combat PTSD. PTSD didn't even enter our vocabulary until the 1980s after the Vietnam War. But we can see hints of its existence in writings from Homer to Dickens. So let's go back thousands of years to some of the earliest evidence we have for what would become PTSD. At Marathon in 490 BC, Athenian hoplites fought against the invading Persians. And amidst the martial clamour and tumultuous cries, an Athenian, Epicellus, stood in horror. He was immediately stricken with blindness. And according to Herodotus, even after the Athenians had won, Epicellus, who neither having received a blow in any part of his body, nor being hit with a missile, and for the rest of his life, from this time, he continued to be blind. Epicellus was suffering from hysterical blindness, a rare symptom of PTSD. He seems to have been the first figure in human history that we can pinpoint as walking away from a battle with mental injuries. The psychiatrist Jonathan Shea in his 1994 book Achilles in Vietnam noted that the returning veterans of the Vietnam War shared some parallels with the experiences of Achilles in the Iliad. According to Shea, the story of Achilles was the story of a soldier undergoing the effects of PTSD. When Hector kills Achilles' best friend Patroclus, Achilles is overwhelmed with an inability to sleep or eat and a preoccupation with revenge. Achilles is changed from a regular soldier into one filled with grief and rage. Symptoms of PTSD The Romans too seemed no strangers to trauma. The general Marius fell into a state of dreadful despair and was prey to nightly terrors and harassing dreams. And since above all he dreaded the sleepless nights, he gave himself up to drinking bouts and drunkenness. While possibly a smear campaign, these reports do show us that the Romans were aware of PTSD-like symptoms. Moving on through history, we see the condition that would become PTSD take on many names. Sw Swiss physicians, oh what a difficult word combination. Swiss physicians in 1768 were some of the first to identify PTSD, and they refer to it as nostalgia. The Germans and French quickly picked up on the idea and called it Heimweh and Maladie du pays, or homesickness. Then the Spanish came along and made everything super dark by referring to it as estar roto, which is a uh, to be broken. 
It was only with the massive scale of the First World War that the higher-ups and even the public began to pay attention to the mental states of soldiers. Hundreds of thousands of men were returning home from the front lines completely traumatized. Contemporary theories suggested that it was the large artillery weapons that were causing it. Thus, the term shell shock came into common use. Rapidly this understanding changed and even the doctor that coined shell shock changed his mind. The nightmares, the tics, the flashbacks, these were mental injuries. Unfortunately, this allowed people to just blame weak character and ignore the victims. As World War II, humanity's most destructive endeavor, went on, the scale of this stress only increased. According to Stéphane oudal rousseau and Antoinette Becker, one-tenth of mobilized American men were hospitalized from mental disturbances between 1942 and 45. And after 35 days of uninterrupted combat, 98% of them manifested psychiatric disturbances in varying degrees. It was a resounding rebuttal to those that had claimed that only men of weak character were suffering breakdowns. By the end of the war, combat neurosis had transformed into combat exhaustion, which soon became battle fatigue. Finally, during the Vietnam War, when record numbers of soldiers returned to the United States with traumatic injuries, we see the term post-traumatic stress disorder appear. From the evidence that we do have, it seems that, to some degree, PTSD did occur in ancient times. But modern soldiers seem to be affected much more. And why is that? First of all, danger was much more localized for the ancients. There were no drones, no one could shell you from miles away, and IEDs didn't threaten the local Roman legion. When an ancient warrior went to war, they usually saw the faces of their enemy, and felt some control over their fate. Along with this, the danger was almost entirely constrained to planned set pieces and short bursts of fighting on the battlefield. Once they were back at their camp, an ancient soldier's mind could rest. Modern soldiers have no refuge and need to be constantly vigilant. Explosives too are common and concussions follow along with them. It has been shown that concussions vastly contribute to the risk that PTSD will develop. Being blown up and the effects of explosions were not something that Caesar and his legions would have to take into account. And then we have culture. The ancient world was much more violent than our own. A Roman inhabited a world in which half of all children wouldn't survive their first years. The sight of blood and death was not as shocking to them as it would be to a modern human. The expectations and social roles of soldiers were almost entirely different. Greek and Roman society, for example, told boys that being a good warrior, slaying their enemies and bringing home loot was one of the most glorious things a man could do. By going out and killing others, a man was filling a vital and respected societal role. While a 21st century person, even though they have been raised in a culture that respects soldiers, upon killing, he will need to reconcile with an upbringing that taught him that killing in any form is wrong. Now, while we are noting all of this, it's important to take into account that we aren't diagnosing these ancient people with PTSD. While this ancient evidence does hint of reactions to traumatic stress, we should not simply slap a modern label on it. It could be that there are many different forms of PTSD that can arise in different cultures and civilizations at different times for different reasons. What we can be certain of though is that ancient soldiers did suffer something. Especially because from an evolutionary viewpoint, short term PTSD is a really good idea. After being in danger you want to be hyper vigilant, you want to wake easily and you want to constantly be reminded of the thing that scared you. Long term PTSD though is a problem, rather than being prepared people cease to function in normal society. Modern soldiers, especially Americans, are undergoing a massive spike in long-term combat trauma. Why is this? Well, any upset in life will always have long-lasting consequences if it isn't communalized. Experiences need to be shared to be properly dealt with. One of the reasons for the spikes in PTSD cases in Vietnam was the suppression of grief afterwards. According to Jonathan Shea, 
This contrasts the grief recorded in the Iliad, in which warriors on both sides would engage each night in ceremonies of grieving. Open grief at the death of a comrade was fully accepted by Homeric warriors. To weep was to lose one's dignity among American soldiers in Vietnam. It is this communalization of trauma and grief that could be why victims of massive disasters tend not to suffer PTSD at the rates of those in combat. In 1915, an earthquake killed 30,000 people in Avezzano, Italy in less than a minute. The worst hit areas had a mortality rate of 96%. The rich and poor died all the same and everyone that remained was tossed into a state of survival. Food, water and shelter became the only priorities. An earthquake achieves what the law promises but does not in practice maintain, one of the survivors wrote, the equality of all men. During World War II, for nearly 60 consecutive days, German planes bombarded London, killing hundreds with each run. This would become known as the Blitz, where 8 million people endured an aerial bombardment that would crack the minds of regular soldiers. And yet, mass hysteria didn't break out. Barely a case of individual hysteria broke out. Psychiatric wards across the country saw admissions go down. One doctor ventured to suggest that some people actually did better during wartime. During the riots in Belfast between 1969 and 1970, the suicide rate dropped by 50%. Homicides and other violent crimes also went down. Depression rates took a sharp decline, all while chaos took the streets. When people are actively engaged in a cause, their lives have more purpose, with a resulting improvement in mental health, wrote Irish psychologist H.A. Lyons in the Journal of Psychosomatic Research in 1979. People will feel better psychologically if they have more involvement in their community. Sometimes it takes sectarian violence, German bombers and angry plate tectonics to make modern humans speak to each other. Humans are so strongly wired to help one another that our brains enjoy doing so. After the September 11 terrorist attacks in New York, there wasn't a mass shooting for two years. The murder rate dropped by 50% and even veterans with PTSD noticed their symptoms improved in the months following the attacks. The people around them no longer felt like complete strangers as everyone was now connected by this traumatic event. Tragedies, for a short time at least, transform us back into a tribe. It's that bond that traumatized people tend to miss. Well then, what is it about modern society that triggers long-term trauma? For one, lack of social support has been found to be twice as reliable at predicting PTSD as the severity of the trauma itself. As theorized by Sebastian Junger in Tribe, modern societies have almost completely eliminated trauma and violence from everyday life. Anyone who does suffer those things is deemed to be extraordinarily unfortunate. This creates an identity of victimhood that can delay recovery. A modern soldier returning from combat goes from the kind of close-knit group that humans evolved for back into a society where most people work outside the home, children are educated by strangers, and personal gain almost completely eclipses collective good. Whatever the technological advances of modern society, the individualized lifestyles that those technologies spawn seem to be deeply brutalizing the human spirit. When soldiers return from faraway wars, they are returning to a society that is alienating and self-serving. If we look at Israel, which is probably the only modern nation currently at war that retains a strong sense of community directly related to that war. The Israeli Defense Forces have, by some measures, a PTSD rate as low as 1%, despite decades of non-stop horrific violence. Why is this? Well, the conflict is right at their doorstep, and most people have done some sort of national military service. So, according to Dr. Arya Shalev, those who come back from combat are reintegrated into a society where those experiences are well understood. Like we saw previously in the Blitz, according to Dr. Shalev, 
The closer people are to the war, the more the community is able to understand and share the trauma. And as stated by Junger, all the praise in the world won't mean anything if you're not recognized by society as someone who can contribute valuable labor. Modern society just happens to be the worst one for a victim of trauma to be integrated into. For the first time in human history, a person living in a city or suburb can spend an entire day surrounded by complete strangers. Despite all our wealth and advancements, our society is afflicted with some of the highest rates of depression, schizophrenia, poor health, anxiety and chronic loneliness in human history. Rates of depression seem to follow urbanization and wealth. In war, soldiers tend to experience a tribal way of thinking. They have their unit and that bond. When they return home, they find out that the country that they fought for doesn't feel like their tribe. It's hard to know how to live for a country that regularly tears itself apart along every possible ethnic and demographic boundary. In combat, soldiers all but ignore the differences of race, religion and politics within their platoon. It's no wonder many of them get so depressed when they come home. What modern soldiers and other trauma victims need in order to fight off the effects of long-term trauma is a functioning community that is ready to listen to and reintegrate them as valuable members of their tribe. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can find all the sources used in the description and if you like this content, please subscribe. If you're interested in supporting the channel, there are links to the t-shirt store and Patreon also in the description. Thanks a lot for watching, and thanks again to Scribd for sponsoring the video.